Welcome to the Massage Hodge Podcast. My name is Nick Bazurka, a licensed massage therapist in Portland, Oregon. I am joined today by Alyssa Haynes, a fellow massage therapist in Massachusetts with, with over 15 years of experience. She's also a columnist with Massage and Bodywork Magazine and the co-founder of the Massage Business Blueprint, an online resource and community for massage and bodywork professionals with a podcast of the same name, along with her co-host, co-founder, Michael Reynolds. Shout out, Michael Reynolds. Yay, Michael. So welcome Hi, to welcome. Show. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's so interesting for me to talk to you. I've listened to your podcast for so long. I've just- Yeah, uh, and it really- my favorite part about that is that we really are who we are on that thing. Yeah. There's no, um, there's really no fancy voices or whatever. And like, actually I was just realizing that when you introduced me, I was like, hi, welcome as if you were on my podcast. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yep. If you've been listening, yeah. you already know me. Yeah, Anna. for sure. So, uh, and if, if one is listening to this and they're not familiar, you have over 200 episodes. I mean, what do you know what you're at now? It's uh, 296. Two, okay, so we're coming on 300. Is there a 300 party coming up? Probably not. You know, we tried uh, to do that the because um, <laughs> we've put out at least one a week uh, for the past five years. We actually, Blueprint is having its five-year anniversary like this week, this month. And uh, we put out at least one a week. And then for every so often, we'll run a special series of interview episodes. So we'll put that in like extra. And um, so yeah, we hit 296. And we tried to do like a celebration, I think on our 100th episode, maybe and it was like just a flop. We were like, this is dumb. Let's just keep doing uh, what we do and not try to be fancy. So we <laughs> totally <laughs> we're terrible. You know, Michael and I both our birthdays are in May. So we're so obsessed with and like narcissistic about our birthdays that we really don't do anything to celebrate uh, the blueprint anniversary every year. Like, I just ain't nobody got time for that. We're good. <laughs> Well, if you're if you're only hearing about the massage business blueprint podcast here, which would be surprising to me, uh, because I, I sort of feel like it's the go-to in that sort of niche of like support for massage and bodywork professionals. But you talk about accounting and taxes, dual relationships, marketing, SEO, office policy, just basically everything that business you didn't and learn. In, yeah. And like, that's really veered into like business practices and a lot of finance stuff. The, the things we don't do, um, are hands-on stuff. Yeah. If we don't, we will refer to any kind of hands-on instruction or anything outside of people talking about what CE they like or how to market a particular modality or pathology issue. Um, so yeah, we stay with the business and marketing because we found that's where that's where the holes are in our knowledge as massage therapists. Unless you come from a corporate background or you come from accounting or you come from marketing, you just, most of us didn't have a grasp on the business practices uh, and the marketing aspects until we were in the thick of it and needed to get bodies on our tables. Yeah. Yeah. So just, just that's all just tremendous. So you're here as part of my ongoing series to, to interview a therapist from all 50 states. Massachusetts, which I'm embarrassed to admit I had to learn how to spell properly. <laughs> Maybe that's common. Sorry, right. I did too. It's fine. <laughs> I still get it wrong. I found on state, spell check. Yeah. Before we talk about your state, I what I don't know about you is how you came to massage therapy in the first place. So I um, went to college for nothing in general, because I didn't know what else to do. And I got a degree in liberal studies with concentrations in political science and women's studies. So as I was telling a friend today, if you want to have like a really in-depth conversation about textile uh, work as a form of women's art from ancient Asian uh, cultures to now, I'm qualified and capable of doing that. But that doesn't have a lot of applicable skill nowadays. So, um, or even when I graduated from college in 97. So I got out of college, didn't know what to do. I ended up taking, or I ended up applying for a little part-time job at a drugstore just to keep me busy while I went to a paralegal program. And 
I ended up working in the pharmacy. And so I was like working retail pharmacy as a technician in 1997 before there were training programs and national certification exams for that. And I just stuck with it. I stuck with it for almost nine years. It was around eight years that it started to get just terrible. Mm. And I would cry every day before I went to work because it was so miserable. Mm. And my husband at the time was like, you need to do something else. And my parents had gotten me a couple of gift certificates for a massage. I think my dad kind of set it up and was like, hey, uh, I think he's told the massage therapist, talk to Alyssa about school. And she did. And I applied and I went to the open house and I had my interview and I was in school like two months later for massage. So and yeah. what did your dad, how did your dad come up with that idea? How, what did he see like? You know, I kind of knew... I wanted to be in something related to healthcare. Like I was good at that. I'm interested in it. I loved pharmacy, but I wasn't going to go to school to become a pharmacist. Like mm -hmm. I had already done my college. I was not motivated or financially able to go back for three or four years, you know, and I didn't take a college program in science. So I would have been starting almost from scratch. Right. And it, I didn't want it. I didn't want to be a physical therapist. Um, so I... Yeah, I don't know. My dad was just like, well, this here's a thing you could do. And I think it's reasonably affordable. And and it was actually, it was probably one of the more expensive programs at the time. It was from start to finish with all the equipment and supplies. And like you, you walked out of there with a table and everything. It was like $16,000. So I just like financed the crap out of it and um, went to school. And that was that was it. I didn't think at the time it was going to be the thing I was going to do for this long. I knew it was made me feel useful mm -hmm. and gave me something to do and made a little money. And it turned out to be like a living. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> so that's how I how got to massage. That? That's great. That's, that's great. Thank you for that little origin story. So then switching gears over to Massachusetts, how does one become a massage therapist there? And how does one maintain a license there? Yeah. And this has happened. Our licensure has happened over the course of my career. I think it only, we only got licensure like 10 years ago, maybe 11 years ago. Um, so I'm actually grandfathered in because I was practicing. It oh, wow. used to be that, yeah, it used to be that massage wasn't regulated by the state, but it was regulated town by town. And the town I lived in didn't even regulate it. The town I opened my office in next door, um, they did, or no, vice versa. The town I was practicing in, there, I opened my business, didn't regulate. But the town I lived in, you would literally just like submit your transcripts and a letter to the Board of Health and they'd be like, here, you have a massage license. So I did that. So I at least have like some license, um, even though it wasn't in the town I was practicing in. Mm. And that grandfathered me in. I think at the time that licensure began, my curriculum would have met the, the criteria anyway. Mm. But nowadays, to new and fresh get a license as a new therapist, you need to have a board-approved massage therapy education. I don't even know what board approves that. Um, so, but there you go. That's what it says. And, and you need to have a minimum of 650 hours and they want that broken up into a certain way. So they want a hundred hours of A and P, uh, on top of that, 45 hours of pathology, 45 hours of kinesiology, which I never had. I didn't have kinesiology in my program, hmm. 300 hours in a supervised classroom, like hands-on massage technique, uh, 60 hours in ethics and business and, over the course of this 650 hours, they want 100 hours of unpaid and supervised clinical internship or externship experience, which is a lot. You know, when yeah. I was in school, it was 40 hours in the clinic and then probably another 30 or 40 hours as an intern. Wow. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's considerable, although they've got, um, when I took it, it was an 18 month program part-time. Now they can, f they fly students through in like eight or nine months. Oh, wow. And, um, or you can do more stretched out programs. Um, and does part -time. have to take one of the major national exams there, MBLAX or otherwise? If you have not completed a certain amount, if, if your curriculum doesn't match up, then yes, you have to take the Amblex. But it was oh. really unclear. I actually asked around and could, and I read all of the regulation and it's super unclear because it sounds like you only need to take the Amblex if your curriculum hasn't, like say you went to school in another state 10 years ago, hmm. um, 
to it's so it, you know getting a fresh license from beginning as a new therapist is a lot different from trying oh, to transfer right. you can't transfer a license in from another state but you can show up and say hey here's my curriculum here's been my experience working if you can show that you've had a certain number of hands on working over the past several years they'll waive some of the curriculum requirement and sometimes you need to take an exam and sometimes you don't is the best i could understand it and that anybody could explain it to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, you need to get a quarry, like a background check. Um, okay. You need to reference letters and you need $225. And that will cover yeah. your application and your first year of license. Yeah. And to keep that license, it's $150 a year for your practitioner license. Uh -huh. And on top of that, along with your practitioner license, where you need to have an establishment license. So, oh. and you need to have an establishment license even if you don't have an establishment. Oh, so hi. if you don't have an office, but you do home visits, you still need an establishment license that covers where you store your supplies and equipment. Okay. So, yeah. So like if I went to work at like a chain as a W-2 employee, I do not need an establishment license. But if I work out of my own office or I work out of my car, or if I do mobile visits, I need um, an establishment license. It's kind of wacky. And that's new in the past year. Like they, it's taken them a long time to kind of get crap together with our licensure. I mean, they oh. still don't have a CE requirement. I've been licensed for almost 10 years, I think. I was and just there's about no CE. That. Nope. There's nothing. They have been saying for five years that they're working on it. Okay. So, my guess is that they'll come up with something like 12 hours a year and they'll say two hours have to be in ethics or et cetera, et cetera. Um, my guess is it's going to be pretty standard and based on most other states and organizations. Still don't have yeah. it yet, though. Yeah. So hearing you talk about like sort of the clunkiness of that process, like I, one of the things I've been asking about is like the viability and of, of this like more national standard, but like. like Hearing stories like that, I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> it's not viable. Yeah. Um, national standard is a pipe dream. Yeah. Doctors don't even have it. Right. Nurses don't even have it. Physical yeah. therapists don't have it. We're never in the United States of America, which is not that united. We're never going to get a national licensure. We might be able to get a majority of state boards to agree on accepting other state licenses with lots of accommodation for people who've been around for 50 years, but mm -hmm. there's never going to be a national standard yeah. for any major profession in the United States. It is simply not how this country works. Right. It's, it's not constitutional. <laughs> so it's not going to yeah. happen. So, yeah, I, I think it's, maybe it's the, the idea of it is selfish. Cause I love this idea of like getting in a RV and driving across every state and like practicing and I guess some states actually have like a visiting license that they that you can obtain. I, I haven't really. Yeah, and most states have an accommodation, like you know, if you travel with a sports team or oh. you know things like that. But um, yeah, sadly, it's pipe dream. Never gonna happen. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. So here we are in May of 2020. Who who knew that our version of the Roaring Twenties was gonna roar in such a strange way? So can you, can you bring me up to speed on what's happening in Massachusetts, how things sort of unfolded there and where it is now? Yeah. Um, things got a little wacky here the first week or so of March. Um, we started to see more cases and, you know, Washington at that point and Oregon where you, you know, where you are, Pacific Northwest, um, was getting into the thick of it. And, mm -hmm. um, the rest of the country was finally waking up to it. And then we had the Biogen conference, which was a, a biomedicine uh, conference happening in one of the big pharmaceutical places uh, near Boston. We have a lot of medical and pharmaceutical industry here. And someone was positive there and passed it along to, I don't know, 80 or 90 other attendees who went back to different parts of the country, but the bulk of them were based here in the Metro Boston area. Mm -hmm. So um, that that really got us thinking about it much faster than some other areas. And yeah, by March 12th, it was everybody going into work every day was like, is this going to be my last day? We were all just kind of like waiting for a shoe to drop to, for us to realize that we couldn't work. But at that point, like none of us knew anyone who was sick. None of us knew, you know, we weren't even like two or three degrees of separation away from it yet. Yeah. Um, 
I stopped working um, March 12th, but I had a head cold. I had had some allergy stuff earlier in the week and we had like really high pollen counts. So I'm like, this this is just allergies. And then it started turning into a head cold, like the morning of the 12th. And I saw three patients that day and I masked. And then I was like, I'm pretty sure this is allergies, but I'm wearing a mask. And everyone's like, "Eh, that's probably good to do that right now anyway. And by the end of the day, it was a head cold. And, and that night is when stuff got really crazy on the news. And we were like, Nope. And, you know, a friend Rhonda Henry, Henry up from your area, she announced like the day before that she was shutting down indefinitely. And I, I, you know, I started doing the reading that night and I was like, oh crap, I should not be working. Like none of us should be working. Holy crap, this is serious. And yeah, the next day I decided I was going to, I wasn't going, I was, I was supposed to have like three days off anyway. And I was sick. So I was like, yeah, I'm not going to go back for a couple of weeks. And I canceled the next couple of weeks, talked to some other people in my office who rent from me. Um, a few of them took another day or two. They all kind of thought I was bonkers um, shutting it down as soon as I did. And I kind of thought it was bonkers too. Mm. But within like three days, it was very clear that, yeah, it was nuts. And I think yeah. that Mar- that March 12th, the governor canceled school for the ne- next day just to assess. So the superintendent canceled school for the next day just to assess. And then over the weekend, it was like, what? And that's when we heard school was going to be closed for two weeks. And stuff got real. So yeah, that was that. And now at this point, um, you know, we've had a, it's a voluntary stay at home order. Uh, Governor Baker has not been really assertive about um, actual shelter in place. So we're at a voluntary, voluntary stay at home order. Only essential businesses were open right up until today. So yeah. today begins, and they just announced this like three hours ago. Um, As we record on, the, on May 18th, Monday, May yes, 18th. Yeah. Monday, May 18th. So, uh, and I even like watched the, uh, the conference earlier, so I would be up to date for this. But uh, yeah, they started phase one of reopening the state. So we've had a week, maybe more, of consistent decline of new cases and deaths every day. So... Phase one is like manufacturing and some retail, like, uh, what is it? Manufacturing, construction, some retail, but like curbside retail stuff. Like we're not going mm-hmm. into stores and shopping, but you can place an order to the bookstore and they'll put it in your trunk. I see. Um, and certain criteria needs to be met to keep the employees safe. So there's a handful of things opening today um, and over the next couple of weeks, like Boston offices are not opening for another week. Like they're giving employers a week to prepare and get everything they need in order. There's all these wacky criteria like, um, you know, for offices, you can only have 25% of the building capacity. Um, Church services start again on this weekend, um, things like that. So all kinds of criteria. Massage was very clearly clearly placed into phase two. Now Mm. each phase is going to be at least three weeks. Oh, wow. And should there be any increase in infections or deaths or things like that, or overwhelmed hospitals, then we could back to phase zero where everything's locked down mm-hmm. or just stay in phase one until things decline again. They're guesstimating three weeks, at least three weeks in each phase, could be six, could be eight. If we plateau instead of continuing to go down, who knows? Um, Massage is in phase two, so the very earliest massage will open is uh, June 8th, but that's the very earliest. Mm -hmm. I think we all have a feeling it's going to be longer than that. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's kind of where we are. It's a little disconcerting. Mm -hmm. I I was going to say, how have you communicated that to your clients thus far? So, I mean, my clients, all of our clients are also following the news. Yeah. Um, So... I, you know, I've reached out to my clients a couple of times during the closure. The first time to say, my office is closed. I've canceled the next couple of weeks. And I individually emailed clients that first couple of weeks to cancel their appointments. And, uh, and then I just started mass emailing and I just cleared my schedule completely for the next couple of months. I communicated with my clients for the last time two weeks ago because I'm closing my, I've closed my office. Mm -hmm. Um, I am moving out. Um, I have a multi-practitioner office. I do not feel confident that I can keep it safe. Mm. So I shut it down and I'm moving out. I also wasn't going to pay rent on an office I can't use. That is too big for me to be there alone. Um, So I'm moving out. So at that point, like 
I don't have any intention of communicating with my clients again until I go back to work. I see. So, and I don't know when that's going to be for me. Um, I, and this is part of the issue. Like the regular, the, the idea of phases came out with my state today. And it's super disconcerting because even though I and many therapists have done a bunch of lobbying to the governor, to our state level reps, to the reopening advisory committee appointed by the governor, to the board of regulation of massage therapy, a bunch of us have done a ton of advocating for massage to be, be put in the last phases because one, health and hygiene issues, yeah. safety. Um, breathing the same air, closed rooms, close proximity, can't massage from six feet away. But on top of that, there's all of these potential contraindications that we don't know enough about, right? There's all these clotting things coming, like coming up now where people are having all kinds of weird clotting and all kinds of blood vessels and in organs and it's causing organ failure. And we, we just don't know mm-hmm. who is safe to work on. People can be asymptomatic but be, you know, sporting a clot that they don't know about yet. Mm-hmm. Who's going to blow that clot? You know, like, how do we know if deep glute pain is deep glute pain or if it's a clot? How do we know if that pain, you know, around the rib cage is, you know, I had, I had a niece who had a pulmonary embolism at 20 years old. And, you know, she called me on a Friday night and was like, my shoulder really hurts. I'm like, all right, well, what did you do today? we walked through it, a nanny and there were small kids. She's like, you know, I was carrying the kid around. I'm like, throw a hot pack on there. You'll find. Went to the emergency room a couple hours later. Cause one of her friends was like, yeah, you're in a lot of pain. She had a pulmonary embolism. Like, they, <laughs> like we right. don't know. Yeah. These things can be masked or just be completely asymptomatic until they're deadly. So I'm super bummed that obviously our message did not get through. Yeah. I'm really ripped. I'm, I'm downright ripped because when, um, the Massachusetts chapter of the AMTA put, you know, sent a letter to all of these boards and and regulators, um, they didn't mention any of these potential contraindications. They only mentioned, you know, health and hygiene, safety and hygiene, you know, transmission stuff and how important massage therapists are in the role of healthcare and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And nothing about how we could blow a clot and kill somebody. Mm-hmm. So that's where we are in Massachusetts. That's my my monologue on that. Yeah, it sounds very complicated, <laughs> like like so many of these situations. So really, I mean, think about this. So, like, a client walks into your office. How do you screen them at this point? What do you do? Do we take their we take their temperature? Okay, but if they're asymptomatic, it's irrelevant, right? How totally. do you screen for an asymptomatic clot? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's impossible. Yeah. So I know you've been making materials and clearly you've been advocating for your state. What else, what else you've been doing during the shutdown? And I know from listening to the podcast that you're struggling with homeschooling type situations. The same same as I am. My boys are Less of a struggle now. Um, (laughs) We've kind of like almost stopped trying with the homeschool, with the distance learning is what it is. Cause we're okay. not homeschooling. That's true. Um, yeah. so yeah, I mean, I'm packing up my office, you know, this is, I mean, this is it. I get up at six in the morning, six or between six and seven. And I put in two to three hours of work creating stuff for massage business blueprint. Um, we recently moved, we shut down our old website created a new website, moved our community from a Facebook discussion group to a whole new platform with all of our premium resources embedded in there. Super cool, but it has involved rewriting five years worth of business and marketing content. So, and we'd been planning this, you know, for two years. Um, I was just really slow uh, getting the writing done. So I put in a cup and and so we, we have most of our content now where we need it to be, but I'm, Mm -hmm. that's a regular project. I still have like three more categories of stuff to conquer. Wow. So Yeah, I get up and I do two to three hours of blueprint work and then I head into the house and I take a shower and around 10 o'clock, I start with the distance learning with the little one who's 11. Um, I usually, by the time I get in, uh, their dad has done math. Um, So, because I don't, um, fifth grade math is starting to stymie me. Um, I couldn't remember how to like multiply decimal points. The the way they teach math now doesn't make sense. It's different. Yeah, it's It's different. 
I started watching some videos because I wanted to learn it because watching the kids do it is really interesting because it teaches their brain to think in tens. And I, and I like it. It's interesting, but like I could not manually multiply decimal things the other day. Like, you know, I can bust out my calculator and do it and in my, but like watching, doing it the, the old, the long way. Yeah couldn't do it. I can, I can rock division like nobody's business, but it was, I finally was like, I can't do this. Um, but you know, we're having fun with some of it, but it's also just like sitting in front of a screen. It that just stinks. And his teacher's wonderful. And the, but like, we're not spending three to four hours a day staring at a screen, do it like watching really boring video. I was just, I kind of a couple of weeks ago threw up my hands. It was like a nine minute video that was like, it was a teaching assistant, like doing this fraction thing. I was like, it's nine minutes of watching her pen on paper and hearing her at like three minutes in the kid was like, what? And I was like, yeah, we're not doing this. And, um, (laughs) so, and it's, you know, bless the teacher. Like, you know, he has a live class and the teacher is trying to handle her own kids coming in and interrupting the class Uh during the day. So it's not the teachers like they're being pushed way too hard. And, um, so, you know, distance learning is less stressful now that we've stopped caring about it. Um, we are bare minimum on everything. And if, and, yeah, and if an assignment doesn't get done, and also I have a kid on an IEP. So um, we've got different, I mean, we've got ADHD, we've got autism, anxiety, like I'm not doing all the stuff. And so pro tip to parents out there, you know, if you can't get an assignment done and it's a, a, a conflict with your kid, I've been uploading in in place of an assignment that gets uploaded. I upload a document that says we were unable to complete this assignment. It is interfering with our relationship, and uh, we are we are going to prioritize our relationship and mental health today. And that's it. Yeah. Turned in. Bing. Yeah. And, um, that's so a- that's so that's going going much better. But um, my partner built me a an herb garden this weekend for my birthday. So herb some garden. parsley. Nice. Um, and some chives and some, there's a, did you know there's an herb called summer save? Yes, I know. And there's a winter savory as well. I've never heard of it. So it's a thing. I know. And I'm going to grow summer savory. I'm going to grow some tomatoes. Uh, we, you know, we're still doing podcasts once or twice a week. Um, yeah. You know, again, I'm rewriting all the, the content for Blueprint. And we have a column in Massage and Body Work. Um, so I'm, I'm plenty busy. I'm yeah, working no like lack. five to six hours yeah. a day. No lack of things to to keep you occupied for sure. Yeah, I'm super jealous of people like who are watching Netflix because <laughs> or like baking things for fun because I I am only baking and cooking for real food like because we not for funsies. Now I um, did so see on I did see on one of your profiles a pretty epic looking ice cream sandwich. Oh, that was yesterday. Yeah. So um, (laughs) I bought myself, like, I can't do dairy. So um, when I grocery shopped on like Thursday or Friday, I got myself some like really fancy non-dairy ice cream, which I don't normally get because it's like $7 a pint. And um, the kid, one of the kids, the older kid made chocolate chip cookies the other day. And like, nobody was in the kitchen, like in the middle of the afternoon. And I was like, I'm making an ice cream sandwich. And like the kids were coming in, I'd have to hide it. And uh, cause then everybody would want one and there just wasn't enough. And I wasn't sharing my fancy ice cream and it was like a whole thing, but yeah, it was, uh, it was, there were no rules for me this weekend cause it was my birthday. So screw oh, it. Awesome. Happy belated birthday, by the way. Thank you. Tremendous. So, uh, that's all. I'm glad you you're keeping busy and, and uh, as a as a regular listener of your podcast, I appreciate that you're con- carrying on with all of that. So, just m- maybe one more serious turn on the situation. What what is what does the crisis do to massage therapy? However, you want to take that, whether it's just the day to day practical application of massage therapy. What is it? What are people experiencing as a whole? I don't I just. Yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> we'll see, huh? Yeah. Let's have this conversation in six months. Um, I think, or, unfortunately, this is going to weed out the suckers. Um, it's going to weed the people. We're going to lose a lot of massage therapists. We're going to lose a lot of part-time massage therapists, I think. Um, and we're going to lose a, a lot of full-time practitioners because they can't afford to keep their offices. Mm-hmm. Um, I am deeply concerned that our reputation as a profession 
is going to get trashed as massage begins too early in this pandemic before we're really in a recovery phase Mm -hmm. and people get hurt. Mm -hmm. I am terrified of what's going to happen when people get harmed by massage because they were asymptomatic or because the reputation of a massage business gets trashed because they become a vector where many people become infected from their office or from the massage therapist. Cause you know, we're learning, it's not so much about, you know, we got to be careful of light switches and doorknobs, but it's the being in a close proximity for 15 or more minutes with talking going on, mm-hmm. um, people not properly masked. Um, I am concerned that there will be so many massage therapists who catch the virus, are asymptomatic, and transmit it. And now, thankfully, lots of states are getting really good tracing systems going on. Mm -hmm. So you get a positive test and you get a call from one of these these contact tracers and they go they work backwards with you for 14 days, every person and place you've been to and every everybody you've had contact with. And I'm worried that we're going to see a lot of infections traced back to massage therapists. I I'm concerned about what that's going to do to us. I am concerned that um, it's going to make us look bad. It's mm-hmm. going to make us look dirty um, and unhygienic, and it's going to scare the bejesus out of people. Yeah. And so I think it's going to have a real dampening effect on how people want massage or not. I also am worried, like, my massage is super relaxing. There's a lot of, like, deep breathing. There's a lot, and, like, you can't deep breathe comfortably in a mask. Right. So I'm concerned, of course, about how my work will need to change. Um, I'm concerned about my own, how I feel being masked and giving a massage. Like I feel masked grocery shopping and I get overheated and stressed out and claustrophobic pretty quick. Right. And, um, you know, the warm in the mask makes me run. Like, it's like, so I'm concerned. I... I have no idea what's going to happen. I, I think that the people who were not financially stable before this and who were not able to build emergency funds, I think they're going to get booted right out because they're going to lose their offices and they're going to have to take other jobs quickly. Right. And I don't know that all of them will get back to massage, especially when you have yeah. barriers. Like you let your license lap and lapse and now it's even more money to get it back. And then you think yeah. about your startup costs, like insurance, like all these things you have to pay for to get started again. I think those are going to be obstacles too big for a lot of people. Yeah. We're going to lose a lot of therapists. That's what I think. Yeah. that's. I think it bad. doesn't look good. Yeah. It's too bad because I sort of feel like all of that background is going to play out in a world where there's a lot of people who will need the work. This sort of like collective experiment we're all conducting in touch deprivation is going to leave a lot of people who could benefit from it now more than ever. And then return to it too quickly is going to make it unsafe and only prolong that. Yeah. Or I'm completely wrong. You know, I've been very much on the end of prudence and patience and not go, not necessarily going back as soon as your state says you can. And there's a lot of people on the other side of that who feel like they can safely give massage and I could be totally wrong. And I just want to be really clear about that. And I know that could be, I will still err on the side of prudence. Yeah. Um, it can also, and, really you know, put, it can put a practitioner in a really difficult spot because you're, you, you're in a community and your clients are going like, massage therapy is allowed to be open. When can I come see you? And you're like, well, I'm still being extra cautious. I'm not open yet. And then you're, you're losing clients who are going like, well, I'll just go see the person who is open. Yeah. And you know, I, oh. I'm so lucky because I've always been um, really anal retentive in my screening and in who I'll see and in and handling complex medical conditions. So it is not, my clients are super cool. Like right now, if I tell them it's not safe to get massage, like 98% of them are not going to get massage for me or anyone else. I've had one or two people be like, oh, come on, it's going to be fine. And to both of them, I've been like, I'm not going to blow, I'm not going to be the one who blows a clot. So we'll see. And, but my clients, I mean, that's just me. That's how I've been for 15 years. Mm -hmm. So my clients are cool. They're, I, I have no pushback other than this makes me really sad. I can't wait till it's safe again. 
So I'm super old in that respect. Yeah. Well, we're going to see how this all plays out for sure. Um, how are your clients responding? Um, I've had, I've had, I had some reach out pretty quickly saying like, like, oh, when can I see you? And you when are you reopening or kind of trying to like get in the door? And when, uh, as like as soon as news hit that Oregon was going to go through its reopening phase, people started contacting me to schedule on the day that they could. <laughs> like, um, but I should also say, I don't, I only, I got back into massage therapy in January. Uh, wow. so I'm a fresh new practitioner basically. So I, I practiced back in 2010 and had a little career and then I took time off to raise my kids and they're bigger now. But so I'm sort of like opening a massage therapy practice at the very worst time. Really? <laughs> yeah. So what's your criteria for like, what's going to determine when you start massaging people again? You know, that outside is, of just your state being like, it's cool. Yeah. The conversations with people like you are helping me to clarify those very things right now and following people like Cal Cates and Heal Well. And I'm, I'm very much in the midst of grappling with that thing. And I think what's going to help me also clarify that is reaching out to my clients as sort of a group and saying, which isn't a huge group again, and just saying like, what, what would you like to see? And here's where, here's, the things I'm thinking about, what are you thinking about? And just kind of, yeah, I'm still navigating is, is the short answer to that. Yeah. Better because, um, today, you know, I woke up this morning feeling really good about my decision to probably not go back until at least the fall. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the governor announces that in theory, we could start as early as June 8th. And I'm like, did I do the wrong thing? Should I have kept my office open? And I mean, I'm texting other people people who used to rent from me and being like, did I, what, how do you feel about this? And, you know, they talked me off the ledge and they're like, yeah, I don't want to go back right now. Anyway, you're doing the right thing by closing yeah. this office. But, but, you know, I'll wake up tomorrow morning again, spinning. And, um, so it's good to hear other people are spinning too. Thanks. Yeah. Spinning, <laughs> spinning, spinning for sure. So, uh, this is a side note to kind of all these crisis and, and your state and all that. But when I have someone with so much experience, I love to ask about longevity as a therapist and sort of putting all the concerns that I think we're going to lose people in the industry because of the crisis, but just in general, as uh, someone who's, who's been in the field for 15 years, what do you say to, to people going that way in terms of wanting to get a long career out of massage therapy? Boundaries are the most important thing. Yeah. Um, and I mean that in so many different ways. One being comfortable saying no when it's unsafe to work on somebody or being comfortable saying no or, or not, not taking on a client or firing a client if they're not a good fit for you because that is going to mentally drain you. Mm -hmm. If you dread going into work because you don't like who's on your schedule, if it's not a good fit. Mm -hmm. uh, boundaries in regards to how you handle your money, what you charge, and also in regards to your scheduling so that you can keep a schedule that works best for you. And again, does not mentally and physically drain you boundaries in the way of structure and how you handle your finances and that you treat your business like a business and you be the best boss that you've ever had. And that means setting money aside for taxes and setting money aside for retirement and setting money aside so you can take a week off without having to double your schedule the weeks before and after. It is, I think you can say boundaries and it encompasses everything. It means saying no when a client wants you to dig deeper either and saying no because it's not safe or because it physically hurts you. If you're doing work that physically hurts you, it's going to really limit your longevity. Mm -hmm. So I think all of those things, and that's really can be wrapped into being comfortable, being uncomfortable. If you, you can become comfortable with uncomfortable conversations, if you can get cozy saying the words, I don't think I'm the best massage therapist for you. Right. The referral. You know that other massage therapists charge $60 an hour. I charge them 20 because the skills that I have are worth that. It's okay if you don't choose me. And saying, I do not work at 7 p.m. on Friday nights, or I do not work Tuesday mornings. Like, being able to say those things so that you truly build the business that energizes you instead of sucks you dry and financially sustains you as part of energizing you. I think 
that that's it. Like, I'm not going to say it's a certain hands-on modality or um, doing yoga every day to keep your body in shape. Like those things are all variable, but the part that's not variable, whenever I see a massage business fail or whenever I see a massage therapist quit, it's because of a boundary failure. And yeah, you know, like everything, it it really is like, and it usually takes me like a minute and a half to pinpoint it because they start complaining about clients they didn't like. Well, why didn't you fire them? Well, I couldn't do that. Cost you your business. And it's it's never one thing, right? It's always like 27 things. So yeah, longevity in massage is about boundaries. Yeah. I'm so glad I asked you that. That's incredible. (laughs) <laughs> we should do a whole other episode just on that. That's a um, webinar series. And also, as someone who's who's been who's been at it for for a while, can you speak to like what I think a lot of people don't realize the value? So there's one thing you have this client who's not working for you, and so you're you know you get them out of your practice, but then people don't realize the value of the long term therapeutic relationship. I'm sure you've had you have clients that you've been, that have been with you for a decade. I have clients that I have been seeing for 15 and a half years because they were they were I saw them as an intern in in the chiropractor's office where I started up and where wow. I initially rented a room because I started there doing some intern hours before six months before I graduated. So I literally have this for 15 and a half years. I think I've got five or six of them. And, uh, yeah, that there, and that's the thing is like the therapeutic relationship is the most important part of what we do. Right. Yeah. So like, that's the one thing is someone showing care and concern for your well being, And then the secondary thing is in my belief is stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system, your rest mm-hmm. and digest. Right. And then you, and then I think like tertiary to that is, um, you know, the physical stuff we do is helping yeah. with pain, helping with stiffness stabilization, all those things. Um, but I think that that's, you know, the third of the things that we do. The most important part is the relationship. And that's, we think even for people who don't like believe that like Reiki or energy work is a thing. And I'm one of those people that I'm like, it's not a thing, but, but let me get to this because it's a therapeutic relationship. I have felt extremely relaxed in a Reiki session and like meditative and whatever. And it's, it is having someone care about my well being for an hour and be present with me for an hour. Yeah. Like that is so healthy and healthful. And I think that so many studies show us that and so many examples show us that. So, yeah, I mean, building these long-term relationships is pretty awesome. Yeah. And I, yeah, it concerns me. I, f- I feel like there's a lot of people, first of all, it's astounding how many people have never pursued professional massage and body work in their lives. But then there's people who just had a bad first experience and maybe it was because that therapeutic relationship wasn't the right one. And if they had just tried one more person, then they would have had this ongoing access to a great a health and wellness resource for their lives. And massage has become more and more mainstream. Like even in the past 15 years I've been working, and I'm sure, you know, in the 10 years that you've been kind of in and out of it, like it's the, the public perception of massage is dramatically different than it was 10 or 15 years ago. More and more people are trying it. And more and more people are recognizing that, you know, that one bad massage they got on vacation is not indicative of all massage. And I think we're doing a really good job in a lot of ways with, with public education. I think individual massage therapists who have taken the time to learn a little bit about marketing have done a wonderful job of explaining what they do versus other kinds of massage. And that is only helping public perception. Creating more educated consumers is just, it's priceless because you get one educated massage therapist or one educated massage client and when they talk to their friends about massage, they're going to teach even more. Like it's, it's, I think it's dramatic how much it's changed. And I think that the bulk of that is happening because, because of educated consumers. And yeah. also, you know, massage therapists, there's more of us, but our ability to educate consumers is getting better and better. And that hopefully will get us over this pandemic hump. We'll see. Yeah, that's great. Well, Alyssa Haynes, thank you so much. Yeah. 
for being here. I will link to everything, the massage business blueprint and that resource, and I'll make sure it's easy for everyone to find. I'd love to chat for a few more minutes after we stop this recording, but thanks for everyone to everyone for listening and we'll catch you on the next one.